Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us again. My name is Dwayne Henderson with Cree's Lighting's uh, training and education team and host of the e-learning series. Uh, for those watching live, happy Wednesday about the sessions. Once we get rolling, the content will be roughly 15 minutes in duration. Uh, our presenters will hang on the line for Q&A afterwards. Although the attendees are muted, we do encourage you guys to use the chat box or the Q&A box to ask questions. Uh, feel free to start that during the session. Wednesdays, as you know, is industry-related industry content day. And today's session will be uh, regarding understanding TM30. This is actually the first part of a two-part series regarding uh, TM30, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, to take us on this journey is Eric Halgard. Good morning, Eric, and welcome. Morning, Dwayne. Welcome. Thank you. Cool. Hey, why don't we real quick, just currently uh, your role in the business, and then we'll, we'll jump right into it. Yep. So currently my role in the business, I work within specification sales, so working with all the specification entities, architects, engineers, people of that nature, um, lighting designers, of course, to try to get our solutions specified into applications and generate business for Cree, Cree Lighting. Perfect. Perfect. And then why don't we get started, talk about what we're going to do today, and then on next Wednesday, what's going to kind of, what, what the path and course that we're, we're charting here. Yeah, sure. So today we're going to talk about where did TM30 come from? We're going to compare and contrast it with CRI. You want to advance the your slide to the next slide? Sure. Uh, we're, we're going to okay. basically compare and contrast with CRI. We'll go kind of deep but quickly into the details of CRI and, and then basically get into how TM30 is different. And then in the following session, we'll try to apply that to the application level uh, and kind of give you an idea of exactly where we're at with respect to recommended practices and how we can actually make use of the data along with recommended practices. To get started, I'm going to start just by talking about the chromaticity diagram. Hopefully it's familiar to most people on the call. We're going to do this to sort of define some terms that we'll be referencing. So the way this thing works is the monochromatic or high saturation colors are located on the outside. So basically from here to here is where we can see color very, very well. This is all the colors that the human eye can see. And as you move off of this high saturation locus, things become more muted or less saturated or more pastelish. Um, I'd like you just sort of think about a paint store experience where you might be going into a store looking through a variety of swatches and noticing that you've got sort of your pastel colors down here and your highly saturated colors up here. And if I wanted to perhaps purchase this color here, the paint store attendant would actually go and get some tint base and start adding pigment until you get to very, very high saturation level. So when we think about saturation, think about that being synonymous with chroma. So low chroma would be more pastel. High chroma would be uh, less pastel, more saturated. So going a little deeper in the details here, that would be the high chroma, low chroma, and then also hue shift. I, if I fan through the pages, especially basically going to a different color category. So think about that as we go through the presentation and reference those terms. A little bit on CR, how does it work? I'm not going to go deep into this definition here, but we'll go to the simple definition. It's simply a measure of a light source ability to show object color reasonably or realistically and naturally compared to a reference source. So it's really just a comparison of how these eight color palettes look under a reference illuminant or reference light source compared to the one you want to test. So it's really a comparative index and really no more than that. Um, you'll notice they're very pastelish colors. They're, they're very kind of, they're not very saturated. So the system also allows you to expand into these other six categories. You can't really combine them with the eight but you can look at them individually. And the one that gets the most dialogue is this thing called R sub A9 or, R, or R9, and that's the very, very saturated red. Um, studies have shown, this is one study, I won't go into the details, but it's there for reference, um, that we, we have this emotional attachment to red, and uh, it has to do with a lot of the light sources, the sun and other light sources being very red dominant, and we're kind of used to that and we, we enjoy that. Uh, so just one, one quote here among many to reference. But you could maybe experience it by uh, maybe a makeup mirror that had 2,700 calorie incandescent light, very, very rich, saturated red light source, and that might be the experience the person gets when they look at themselves in the mirror. Um, you could replace that with a very low red content source like a fluorescent lamp that looks the same from a color standpoint, meaning the chromaticity, but your experience might be that you think you look a little bit pale or anemic. The reason is that Human beings have a lot of rich red blood cells very, very close to their skin. If you look at this reflectivity function over here to the right, about half of the reflectivity of, of human skin lies in that red range. So it's very important. 
doesn't apply just to human skin. There's a lot of other things that occur in nature, like wood tones, for instance. You can certainly see the LED solution uh, to the right has a, a more rich red, but the wood tones look richer also. Turns out metal halide is very, very poor in, uh, in red color content. So what about these reference uh, sources we use? So for testing for CRI under 5,000 Kelvin, we use an incandescent source. It has to have the match CCT to the source you're actually testing. And that would plot in the color space on the black body right about there, right in that range. For 5,000 Kelvin and above sources, we use something called the daylight illuminance, and they plot right about there. There's several in the light just above the black body locus. So there's a little bit of an anomaly here in that there's kind of a gap and a bridge, kind of a disconnect between there. We'll talk about how, how TM30 fixes that. So quite simply to do this calculation, you determine the CCT of a light source, then you create or calculate a reference light source for comparison. You take both those light sources, apply it to the system, and you get a bunch of math. You determine the difference, the average difference between the two color sets for the reference light source versus the, the test light source. So I'm going to run through a real quick example of what that calculation might look like. So here's a 2700 Kelvin bulb. We'll call it the test limit. And the first thing I do is I relate that to a 2700 Kelvin incandescent luminant. And I'm going to look at palette number six because it looks like one of the most distinct differences here between these two sources is that the LED test luminant has a lot more blue than the reference luminant. So if I just simply take that spectral power data, apply it to that palette, there's some reflected energy that I actually plot in this color coordinate system. And I always give that palette a score of 100. Uh, actually, all eight get a score of 100 from the, the reference illuminant. Then I take my test illuminant, do the same thing. I'm going to guess that it's going to get closer to the spectral locus because it has more blue. And there's just a, a spatial difference between those two, and that gets subtracted from 100. So the test illuminant will always have, on any one of these palettes, a lower score than 100. So we simply just apply that to all eight of those color palettes, and it would look like a scatterband such as this. So there's basically eight sets or 16 points. We do some math eight times, we create these numbers. So you'll notice that R1 through R8 here, they're all less than 100. I simply just sum those together and divide by eight to get a CRI. So interesting information. Um, you'll also notice that if I take the lowest match and the highest match and flip-flop the numbers, you can probably convince yourself the numbers are going to be exactly the same. So CRI only gives you kind of an on average difference with only eight color palettes. So CRI has been around about 50 years. It's relatively unchanged the last 40. The limitations were widely recognized, and we've been talking about things for the last 25 years to try to make it better. Several things have been tried. Um, so, and LED has changed it a lot. We can talk about the details maybe in the question section. But in 2013, there was a IES color metrics task group initiated, and they were charged with evaluating the current conditions and actually formulating some new methods. The result of that is we have of the called TM30, it's actually an ANSI standard. And the first release was actually 2015. So this is what it looks like. Um, the main differences listed below are, we have something called a fidelity index or R sub F, which is very, very similar to R sub A or CRI. We're also gonna have a value of something called the gamut index, which is really kind of a measure of how saturated or unsaturated the source is compared to the reference illuminant. And we've got this really cool set of uh, data in something called a color vector graphic that we'll go into in more detail in, in session two. So the first major difference here is we've got 99 test samples instead of, instead of, uh, instead of eight. But really, this is the best representation of about 100,000 test samples uh, that were measured in, in the real world. And it was based on these, these uh, seven very, very common categories in, in which we live. The other thing they did was they fixed this disconnect, so we have between 4,000 and 5,000 now, we have an interpolation that actually connects the daylight locus and the black body locus, so we don't have any big jump there. So now we actually have uh, three, three references instead of, instead of uh, two. And again, we still use the same CCT when doing this. So another color space here, I'm not going to go into the details of it, it's just a more accurate way of calculating color performance. And uh, we haven't invented any new colors. So imagine a portion of that color space that we project into this uh, shape here, and this is our new color space. So as the vertex is very unsaturated, as you move out to the edge, it gets more saturated, and we're gonna call these 16 spaces Q bin. So we have Q bin one through 16. 
and chrome in that direction, hue in that direction, and just, I guess, keep thinking about that, um, that paint color swatch from your paint store experience. So here's the 99 colors we'd apply that data to, and now we've got this scatter band of other than 16 points or two sets of eight, we now have 198 points or two sets of 99. So the math for R sub F, which is very similar to CRI, is actually done with these points in space. So that's where R sub F comes from. We then take it to another, another spot and we calculate uh, using some, some math, the average point from all the hue bins for all the reference illuminates or sort of the normalized point. So it would look like that. So basically each one of these dots represents kind of the average position of the reference illuminate. And then along with that, the average difference uh, of the test illuminate within those hue bins. So if I connect the dots, I get these interesting looking polygons. But there is some interesting information here. So if I look at hue bin one, I will convince myself that this is largely a saturation shift. So kind of going from the reference to less saturated, and sort of contrasting that, I've got what looks like to be more than a hue bin here, hue, uh, hue shift here. Then I've got something here that looks like a combination of both. Um, the next thing that was done was since you would have a different reference illuminant polygon for every single one of your, your reference illuminants, um, we want to make that a little more familiar shape like a circle. And the way we do that is, is essentially take the relative vector displacement of those two dots and you've been one, for instance, and put them in that condition with reference to the, the circle. So in all cases now, your reference limit will be a circle and your test limit will be something that's relative to that circle. So here we've got a nice shape that's kind of oval. Uh, not to say that all your test limit reference are going to be ovals or uh, it's going to be an oval. It could be actually something a little more complex than that, depending on the spectrum. So just some definitions here. R sub F is very, very similar to CRI. The, the major difference is we're using 99 color palettes, um, but it is really kind of the same math, uh, just using a little bit different scale and different, uh, different uh, more color palettes. The R sub G or gamut, gamut index is really kind of a reference to the average saturation of the colors. More saturation would be more than 100, less would be less than 100. So if I look at these two scenes, and maybe the left is before and the, the right is after, and some of were to ask you what you think, you might say it's more vivid, more vibrant, more saturated. You probably wouldn't say it's higher R sub G, but that's kind of what, we're, what, the, what the reference is. Higher R sub G, more vivid, more saturated. So just for reference here, if I had, let's say my test and reference sources were identical, a perfect match, and all those dots would coincide, the perfect match of fidelity. Uh, if I connect the dots, I would have this, this circle that was exactly the same as the other circle, and just like fidelity, the reference to gamut is the test, uh, the reference illuminant always gets a score of 100. So here I have 100 and 100, a perfect match. Um, this looks quite a bit different. So if I were to ask you if, if the area occupied by this red shape was greater or less than the black shape, you'd probably say it's less. And quite simply, the R sub G or gamut is a lower number than 100. A little more contrary to that, you get, you get this, where you could probably convince yourself that the red area is larger than that um, encompassed by the black area. And for that reason, we've got a saturation or R sub G over 100. So just a little bit more on red here. Um, this is a quote from back in 1963, a light containing red and green at the expense of spectral yellow is preferred. This has been well known. So if I look at these two color vector graphics here, if I look to the right, it kind of matches what the statement was, right? I've got a high saturation in red. I've got a high saturation in green. I've got a desaturation in yellow. And you would compare that almost completely contrary to what's over here. So you might think, boy, in any given setting, uh, this might be the preferred light source. But even I need more information. So they're both the same CCT. Uh, they both have roughly the same R sub F. Matter of fact, this one's a little bit higher R, uh, R sub F. And the R sub Gs are about the same. So you know, they're, they're really about the same. So absent the color vector graphic that shows you exactly what's changing within the color gamut areas, we really wouldn't know what the difference between these two are. So that's where we're going to end. I know it was really fast. I think I got that in under, under 15 minutes. Uh, I apologize for, for maybe rushing a little bit, but hopefully we have some good questions. Over to you, Duane. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, so the question is, what is 
tree lighting doing to assist specifiers who want to select a variety of luminaires using TM30? So I'm not sure I understand the question completely, but uh, we're supplying data for one. Um, so it, virtually any product that we have in our portfolio, if we don't publish the TM30 report in a graphical form, we can create the graphical form using our spectral power data, uh, or actually we can deliver that spectral power data to really anybody who wants it. So anybody that's a member of the IS is eligible for a free calculator. It's essentially a Excel spreadsheet, whereby you dump the spectral power data into the spreadsheet, you're, and you're, you're able to create a variety of reports. We haven't gone to report uh, the, the variety of reports. There's a simple, an intermediate, and a full report, and anything within that within that uh, gamut you can create. Yeah, so I think that the hint is that you know a lot of manufacturers today, if you look at what's we're still reporting on and really it's CRI, right? That's a pretty consistent metric that many manufacturers are still utilizing and, and TM30 is, is not probably complete if you're using a variety of manufacturer solutions within a project um, to get all that data. Somewhat, yeah, I, 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 I sense part yeah, of that question was, once you have the data, what do you do with it, right? And that's, that's exactly coincident with what we're trying to cover for session two next week. I think most people that are familiar with CRI, and, and let's, let's just take an office space and say CRI of 80, if, if looking at a, the fidelity metric, which is, is kind of the equivalent in, in TM30, would a fidelity metric of, of 80, it, it would people expect a similar experience as they start to transition maybe to this new tool? Yeah, so you, you, you touched on a few things. So, so you would expect that, right? The, the, the difference is, of course, you're going from eight pallets 99 pallets and a very spiky distribution, something like a fluorescent or a metal halide, um, may yield dissimilar results, I guess I'll call it. The, the intent is to have them be about the same. However, if you've got really smooth uh, distributions throughout the visible spectrum, that actually does happen. When you've got really spiky distributions, the CRI only having eight pallets doesn't, doesn't I'm probably not using the right term, doesn't average out as well. We'll give people uh, another minute here to see if we have any other questions coming in. And Eric, as we do that, we'll give them another uh, minute or so. Why don't you, as we're kind of waiting to see if we get anything else, why don't you just, uh, again, talk a little bit about next week's session and what they can expect uh, there in terms of how we, we continue on this discussion. Yeah, sure. So, so next week's session, we're going to go into the report structure. So where we left off with the example of the two color gamut area references, that is actually kind of a, about what you get in a simple report. So we're going to go uh, deep into those details. We're also going to talk about this, this kind of red color uh, saturation and kind of our infatuation with red and, and then eventually move from that into uh, recommended, not exactly a recommended practice, but some proposals for what best recommendations would be to use the data and then close with, with, with sort of three examples, kind of one where high saturation would be, would be, would be sort of the, the preference, um, another one where very, very accurate color rendition or color fidelity would be the preference, and then one where just basically kind of a preferred overall um, pleasantness to the lighting, and we'll, we'll go over those terms and, and use those three applications and probably a few more. Okay, perfect. The yeah, only thing, other thing I saw come in, there was a question about, um, would these be going to, to, to Creelink? So yeah, the, the, the PDF version of the, of the PowerPoint will be made available on, on Creelink. And then like all sessions, the recorded version of this will be posted to, uh, to YouTube. So Eric, do you wanna to go to the next slide and I'll close up the session? There you go. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Eric. I wanna thank Eric. I also wanna thank the audience, for you guys for joining us uh, today. Just to look ahead to our next live session on Friday, we'll be looking at integrating with Lutron. So as, as many of you know, Cree Lighting is offering more Lutron enabled solutions, so we'll explore that a little bit more fully. Uh, our next design session next week on Monday will be around the office space. And then next Wednesday, as mentioned, Eric will we'll kind of continue our, our conversation around uh, TM30. As mentioned previously, um, if you have any feedback, please feel free to send me a note. Uh, also, if you need to reach out to Eric directly, please feel free to do that. And then lastly, as I mentioned, uh, all the content is recorded and made available on YouTube. If you're not a subscriber, we would certainly love to see you do that as well. All right, until next time, thanks everybody.